Since Nancy Pelosi and the Democratic Party decided collectively that bailing out multi-billion dollar companies is higher on their list of priorities than bailing out working class Americans who are hurting during a pandemic, they've kind of backed themselves into a corner, right? They don't really have any leverage going into future negotiations because they just gave Republicans the one thing that they wanted. And let's be clear here. Democratic Party leadership, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, they also wanted the bailout. But they also, unlike Republicans, have to maintain this facade that they care about working class Americans. So if you already give Republicans the one thing that they wanted, what incentive do Republicans have to come to the table and meet you even halfway on another bailout package for the American people? The answer is they have no incentive. And predictably, now that Democrats have already played all of their cards, gave away all of their bargaining chips, Politico reports that Republicans feel absolutely no pressure to cave to the demands of Nancy Pelosi and the Democratic Party. So they're saying explicitly, we have absolutely no intention of working with Nancy Pelosi. And Nancy Pelosi knows that she has to find some way to try and at least make it appear as if she's fighting for working class Americans. So she has one move she can make here. She writes a bill and she knows it's not going to get passed, but she at least makes it a really robust bill that actually would objectively be good for working class Americans. And even if this isn't going to ever be codified into law because Mitch McConnell won't let it pass, he won't allow a vote on the Senate in the Senate on this, and Trump won't sign it into law, at least Nancy Pelosi can kind of use this as a political weapon to bludgeon Republicans over the heads with, and she can excite the base by saying, look, if you come out and support Democrats in November, this bill is what you have to look forward to. And to an extent, she is doing this. She is doing politically what she has to do. And even if this is political theater, you know, she she's doing what we expect her to do. Take a look. It may be partisan on their part, but it's not partisan on our part to meet the needs of the American people. Now, this is exactly what we expected. But I will say it comes two, two and a half months late because we're in a pandemic and people are hurting. Millions of people have filed for unemployment. People are literally going hungry in this country. Thousands upon thousands of people are dying every single day. So if Nancy Pelosi genuinely cared about the American people, she wouldn't have agreed to any bill if it didn't provide Americans with adequate relief in round one. Because she knows how Republicans operate. She's not a stupid person. She knows they're going to play hardball with her. So if you don't get everything that you want... The first go around, or at least most of what you want, odds are, especially if you give away everything that Republicans want to them, they're not going to come back and meet you halfway in the future. So her only play now is to construct a bill that is so robust, so progressive, it excites the base. Give Americans everything that they want. Bring together all wings of the party. Bring progressives into the fold who feel demoralized currently after a very, you know, um, competitive primary where we lost and adopt all of their policy proposals because it honestly doesn't matter at this point. This isn't going to pass. This isn't going to be uh, codified into law. So she has nothing to lose and everything to gain. She can make progressives feel heard if she listens to them. And there's a number of demands from the Congressional Progressive Caucus that she can easily adopt and look like a hero. That includes a recurring direct cash payment, a moratorium on evictions and foreclosures, at least $30,000 in student debt relief, suspending debt collection, expanding Medicare to those who lost their jobs due to COVID, fully subsidizing the cost of healthcare expenses for victims of COVID-19, increasing food stamps, creating a federal paycheck guarantee program, uh, instituting vote by mail ahead of November's election because if she doesn't do this, she's basically setting up the Democratic Party for failure. I mean, she has no reason to not add all of this. You have to bring progressives into the fold, make them feel heard as a leader. This is a sizable wing within your party. So if you keep isolating them and marginalizing them, you're just going to drive them away. You have no reason to not adopt all of this because we know this is just about optics. It's not going to pass. But what did we get? Well, we got a bill with uh, some demands uh, from progressives, but even the good in this bill doesn't come without a really bad poison pill. 
If you want the good, you're going to have to take the bad. So let's give you the rundown of what's included in this bill. As Erica Werner of the Washington Post reports, the 1,800-page legislation, which the House is expected to vote on Friday, would devote nearly $1 trillion to state, local, territorial, and tribal governments and establish a $200 billion HEROES Fund to extend hazard pay to essential workers. It would also send a second and larger round of direct payments to individual Americans up to 6000 per household. Other parts of the bill would increase nutrition assistance benefits by 15% and provide $175 billion in housing assistance, among other things. A $600 weekly increase in unemployment insurance would be extended through January, and the bill directs another $75 billion for coronavirus testing and contact tracing. Other provisions include $25 billion for the U.S. Postal Service, a frequent target of attacks from President Trump, and a new requirement for passengers and employees on airlines, public transit systems, and Amtrak trains to wear masks. Protections are included for legitimate cannabis-related businesses, and there is $3 billion to increase mental health support and $400 billion to help the Census Bureau deal with coronavirus-related delays in the 2020 Census. The Democrats' legislation also includes provisions to ensure that all voters can vote by mail in the November election and all subsequent federal elections, an idea that Trump and many Republicans have rejected because they say it invites fraud. It would be Congress's fifth coronavirus relief bill, building on the $2 trillion CARES Act passed in late March. But while the first four bills were the result of urgent bipartisan compromise in the early days of the pandemic, now the two sides aren't even talking and are moving in radically different directions. It's unclear when they will come together to produce another bipartisan partisan response, but some Republicans suggested it might not be any time soon. So let's be objective here. Let's give credit where it's due. There are some provisions in this bill that will absolutely help the American people. I think increasing food stamps by 15%. That's really important. Now, I personally would have bumped it up to 25%. Give people that extra cushion because you're not going to give them too much money in this instance because it's not like they'll buy too much food and, and it'll go bad. Like you put that money on an EBT card and if they get too much, it'll roll over. What matters is that people are fed. They're not going hungry and more is better than less at this point because we don't need people in America lining up for bread lines that go multiple blocks. Like that's just not acceptable. But I mean, nonetheless, I'll take this 15%. Um, the $1,200 um, payment, it's another one-time payment. Not good enough. It needs to be recurring. Why wouldn't you just adopt the $2,000 monthly recurring payment that will go to Americans throughout the duration of this pandemic? Why another one-time payment? It's not enough. Now, it's better than nothing. Americans would still really value this currently, but there's no reason to not include a recurring payment in a bill that's not going to be passed. But aside from that, you know, I don't want to be overly critical of the good provisions because there's some really important measures here. Vote by mail, crucial if Democrats want to win in November and going forward because that will increase turnout. On top of that, increasing the amount of tests for COVID-19. There's some great things in here, but this legislation doesn't come without its really, really awful provisions. For example, first of all, HuffPost's Matt Fuller explains that there's a provision that is a brazen giveaway to the richest 1% of Americans. We're talking about Nancy Pelosi's relentless pursuit to roll back the SALT tax cap. It's just a brazen giveaway to the wealthiest Americans. I don't know why she's so hellbent on doing this. This is a bill about optics, let me remind you. Nonetheless, she had to include that in this bill for no reason other than to just kind of give a wink and a nod to her donors um, who bankroll her campaign. I don't know. On top of that, uh, this headline from The Intercept's Akila Lacey and John Walker, I think, really says it all. Heroes Act delivers a win to the health insurance industry. The Heroes Act, the new coronavirus relief bill introduced by House Democrats on Tuesday, includes protections for employer-sponsored insurance plans, which the healthcare industry has been lobbying Congress on for weeks. The proposed legislation includes subsidies for continued coverage for furloughed workers and people using COBRA, a continuing health coverage plan for those who have lost work, even if they don't pay their premiums. The bill also creates avenues for premium assistance for certain categories of 
of people who want to pay those premiums anyway and would open a special insurance enrollment period a week from the date it's enacted into law. It also provides nine months of premium payments to health insurance plan administrators who don't receive them during the ongoing pandemic. The push to protect health insurance premiums comes as some healthcare companies like United Health, Humana, and Cigna have reported profits during the pandemic amid record high unemployment levels and have boasted that they don't expect to take a financial hit. Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders wrote an op-ed on April 28th criticizing Democrats' push to subsidize COBRA. Quote, subsidizing COBRA, as they have suggested, would be both expensive and ineffective. Not only would health insurance corporations make massive profits off the plan, profits that come at the cost of the American taxpayer, but it would still leave tens of millions uninsured or underinsured, he wrote. Expanding COBRA during the pandemic would do nothing to cover those who already lacked insurance, he added, noting that the program subsidies for premium would not provide relief for low-income workers who still have to pay high deductibles. So let me remind you that in a bill that will not get passed, in a bill that's just about optics to excite the base, you're throwing red meat to the base, Nancy Pelosi and Democrats still have to provide some giveaways to their donors and the health industry. They already know that you're fighting for them, Nancy Pelosi. In a bill that is basically nothing more than political theater, you don't have to do this. You can easily uh, write in a quick fix. You expand Medicare to every single worker who lost their job because of COVID-19. Now, that's not good enough in my opinion, but we need quick fixes during a pandemic. Expanding Medicare would show people who are recently unemployed that the Democratic Party is fighting for them. But you couldn't even do that in a bill about optics. Embarrassing. Now, on top of that, it gets worse. There's a provision in this legislation that amounts to a literal bailout of corporate lobbyists. As Jake Johnson of Common Dreams reports, the bill, which the House is expected to vote on as early as Friday, does not contain recurring direct cash payments, a paycheck guarantee, cancellation of rent and mortgage payments, or expansion of Medicare to cover the rapidly growing number of unemployed and uninsured Americans. The legislation does, however, propose an expansion of the Paycheck Protection Program eligibility to include corporate lobbying organizations, which aggressively pushed for the change and a bailout for landlords. Democratic leadership has had plenty of input from progressive thinkers over the past couple of months. They just care more about the input from corporate lobbyists, tweeted HuffPost senior reporter Zach Carter. There is just no excuse for this. So we are rolling back the salt cap. We are uh, bailing out corporate lobbyists, literally. Oh, and in case I didn't bring this up earlier, we're also bailing out debt collectors and landlords. And how many of the progressive provisions were adopted? About less than half. Again, this is about optics. This bill will not be passed. I know I sound like a broken record, but I have to keep overstating that so people understand just how ridiculous this is. Now, again, the bill itself is not all bad, but with the good, you take a lot of really horrible provisions, horrible provisions, and with those horrible provisions, you still don't get adequate relief for Americans. So you can maybe maybe make the case that if we got everything on the Congressional Progressive Caucus's wish list, maybe those bad things would be acceptable because she's trying to bring together both the corporate and progressive wings of the party. But she really uh, sent the message to the left again that she doesn't really care about them. Now, Nancy Pelosi was actually challenged by Representative Pramila Jayapal, and she sounded off about this on Twitter explaining why this bill is weak. Like, it's not awful. It's not 100% bad, but it's still not adequate. It still doesn't go far enough when people are hurting and we have to think big. Now, here's the thing. I absolutely admire that Pramila Jayapal is speaking up. She's one of the few progressives who actually does challenge Nancy Pelosi from time to time, even if she does go along with a lot of what Nancy Pelosi wants. But she just tweeted this out. If I'm Pramila Jayapal... I'm not just going to tweet this out. I'm going to call up MSNBC. I'm going to go on CNN. I'm going to drag Nancy Pelosi for this. Because even if there are some good things, some more crumbs for the peasants, it doesn't go far enough. 
So don't let Nancy Pelosi hide behind some of the good things that are in this bill to push for her pro-corporate agenda where she literally bails out corporate lobbyists. You can't let her do that. You can't let her monopolize discourse surrounding the HEROES Act. You've got to name her and shame her explicitly. And I get that that's really going to be awkward for you because she's your colleague. She's your boss. But let's be real here. Progressives have really got to start fighting fire with fire, playing hardball, because you are a sizable enough caucus now to where you actually have some leverage. You just got to use it. Like Ro Khanna, AOC, Pramila Jayapal, even Katie Porter, who's more of a Warren Democrat, these individuals, they have leverage. They have to use it. They've got to fight fire with fire and play hardball and not be afraid to call out leadership. Like, I admire her for calling out Nancy Pelosi through Twitter. But let's be real, that's not enough. Like, look at what the Freedom Caucus was able to accomplish. They're a minority within the Republican Party, but they absolutely never hesitated to give the Republican Party establishment and leadership specifically hell. They would hold up any legislation that didn't meet their criteria, and they were successful in shifting the Overton window to the right and the aggregate Republican Party further and further to the right. So if you don't adopt some of the political strategy that we saw from the Freedom Caucus, knowing that you have a pretty sizable caucus yourself, you're not going to be successful. I think that, you know, tepidly wording a dismissal of this bill and its weaknesses on Twitter isn't going to suffice. You have to actually whip the votes, get members of the Progressive Congressional Caucus to not vote on this, not support this, not back Nancy Pelosi when she needs you. Because if she knows you're going to be there for her like that, and every time she says jump, you say hi, how high, she's never, ever, ever going to actually take you seriously. She's always going to take you for granted. So, um, you know, I think that what progressives and the left collectively need to learn from this is that Democrats don't take the left seriously because the left is always there for Democrats when they need them. So what we have to do going forward is withhold votes. Don't vote on Nancy Pelosi's le legislation. Don't let her hold committee appointments over your head. Actually fight fire with fire. And if she wants to blast you, go on corporate media. Go on corporate media and blast her back. Corporate media will side with Nancy Pelosi. But if you can at least force her to defend herself for the first time, from within the Democratic Party, maybe that can make a difference. Now, you could fail doing this, but at least trying and failing is better than not trying, not fighting fire with fire, not fighting hard enough against these corporate Democrats who are using every single institutional mechanism to silence and uh, marginalize the left further. So, you know, this bill, again, I don't want to say it's all bad because if this bill were to pass, there'd be some really good provisions in this that would help the American people, objectively speaking, but we shouldn't be forced every single time to take some good with a lot of really harmful provisions that come with it. We shouldn't do that, especially when we're talking about a bill that is political theater. It's just about optics. Can't we at least for once in a bill that's not going to get passed, have it just be clean, have no giveaways to corporate America? Well, I mean, I think we can, but we just have to start using our voices. People in Congress, specifically progressives, have to use their voices more effectively. And I think they've really got to come together, bind together, and they've got to agree to be a very strong and vocal block. Because if they don't actually start applying adequate pressure on leadership, they're not going to get what they want. They will continue to be steamrolled, withhold votes, not just for these bills, but for leadership positions. You've got to fight them. If you don't, Things like this are going to continue to happen. And look, I criticize Nancy Pelosi often because, you know, I say that she doesn't know how to play politics when you see the way that she fights against Republicans. But I'm going to walk back everything that I said about Nancy Pelosi with regard to her not being strategically savvy because she is savvy, right? She knows how to play politics. We, sh we see the way that she plays politics against the left. It's just that she's not playing politics with the Republicans because she agrees with them. She agrees with them on economic issues, so why would she fight them when they're doing what's good for her, what she wants, what is at the behest of her donors, quite frankly? So she knows what she's doing. She knows how to marginalize the left and play them like a fiddle. And it's time that congressional progressives put their foot down and not accept this anymore.